People are universally fascinated by melting glass. Glass, you literally can make anything with it. Glass has this luminosity and a depth of color you cannot get in anything else. No two pieces of glass are ever alike. Glass is an expression. It's an extension of everything I do in my life because it's color. And the first time I discovered that I could control what that color was, I never looked back. Gas had just been found in eastern Indiana, and there were a lot of gas wells. And so people were moving in here in the 1880s to try to take advantage of that. It takes a lot of fuel to make glass. Free natural gas or very cheap natural gas very much attracted a lot of industry to east central Indiana. It seemed like the opportunity of a lifetime. Companies were sold on the fact that the gas was going to last forever. By the early 1900s, it had run out. Major cities in those counties, Anderson, Muncie, Kokomo, largely exist today uh, because of the, the glass industry that sprang up because of the natural gas. There's no glass name in Indiana that says glass, especially to folks outside of Indiana, more than the ball name. This is a ball perfect mason, most common ball jar you're gonna find. This sand that was used to make this jar came from a dune in northern Indiana, the Indiana Dunes. The Ball family originally decided to build a branch factory in Indiana. Their mother very early on suggested that they find something to do that they could all do together. They were from Buffalo, New York. Civic leader James Boyce offered land, money, and free fuel for them to come to Muncie. By the time the gas ran out, they were the largest manufacturers of fruit jars in the world. We have Ball Hospital and we have Ball State University, uh, but they did so much more than that. This community would look very different if the Balls hadn't been here and the fact that they still very much have a presence here. This place is actually the, the oldest continuous operation facility in the United States. We produce in total around 4 million glass containers every 24 hours. This is 126 year old plant that began here in just a very, very small community. They actually brought flatbed railroad cars full of employees up from Kentucky and Arkansas. They had children, the children worked here and grandchildren and it's just continued. This is a one big family now and there's a lot of pride in that. When I go to the grocery store, the first thing I do, if I'm buying spaghetti sauce, I'm going to turn that jar around to make sure that I made that jar before it goes into my grocery cart. We never close, we never shut down, we run 24-7, and it has never stopped. It's continuously produced glass containers for 126 years. We are America's oldest manufacturer of machine rolled art glass. We fill requests by studios and architects all over the world who want to use Kokomo glass. Kokomo Opalescent's first major customer was Louis Tiffany in New York. A lot of uh, Tiffany's early glass work was uh, opalescent glass made in Kokomo. Oh, Cindy, you have a call on line six. Disney's needing some more samples. <laughs> and you'd be like, yay! You know, it's exciting. It's exciting when, when somebody like Disney calls and wants samples. I use Kokomo opalescent glass to make the items like windows and lamps and sun catchers. Kokomo opalescent can make one color all day long, and the streaks and the striations are always going to come out just a little bit different. When I look at a sheet of glass, I see the, the batch man who mixed all those chemicals together. I see him shoveling those chemicals into the furnace for cooking. I see the three ladlers who ladled that glass to the mixing table. I see the table man who blended those colors together. 
See the two men at the end of the layer who trim off the rough rolled edges? I see somebody hold that finished sheet up. I see that with every sheet of glass that goes out this door. Glass has always been part of the culture that I grew up in, whether it was molding it or producing it. When we would take family vacations, I would drag my family through the glass factory that might be near, and I really fell in love with the scale of the flame working. Most of the glass in Indiana was of a functional form. We've seen that glass has become more of an accepted art form, and I like the solitude of being able to just go out and play in my own studio. Glass itself is a very sensual material because it interacts so wonderfully with light. It's like taffy in what it can do. It's infinitely moldable. It has so much potential to be and become your vision. Carrie is a third generation glass artist and his son, who's a pharmacist by day, also is a glass blower with Carrie on the weekends. So there's a fourth generation of Zimmermans. The thing that I enjoy the most is the tradition of it. And you know, and since my grandfather, my great grandfather, my dad, we all did it and we just grew up around it. Some of the tools that we use obviously are the same ones that my father and my grandfather used. First of all, he loves it like his dad did. I do see a lot of the same habits and ways of doing things that his dad did. Of course, that was because he worked with him and watched him all the time. You know, it's all I ever wanted to be was a glass blower. When we were kids, you know, when we would start a campfire or something, we'd always grab sticks and act like they were rods, you know, and put them in the fire and pretending that we had glass on them. So making glass is actually very athletic. It's not easy work. You have to be tough and you have to be strong. Carrie in 1983 was the NCAA decathlon champ. Being a great athlete transfers into being able to make a really nice piece of glass. I remember uh, my dad picking me up, you know, probably kindergarten or first grade after school, watching him make glass, him and my uncle. And then, you know, and if I was good on Fridays, I always got to make a paperweight. I think that's all he's ever wanted to be was a glass blower, and he's really good at it. He actually made his first one when he was six years old. It's just such a wonderful thing to be part of it, you know, wonderful feelings to be part of a glass making family. I really have enjoyed it all through the years. In high school, my junior year, I needed to drop advanced physics, and the only class that was open was stained glass, so I took it. And I fell in love with glass. I absolutely fell in love with it. Bloomington is a fabulous city. It's so rich in the arts, but it's totally lacking in hot glass. So I decided to start a studio. This is the Bloomington Creative Glass Center's sixth annual Great Glass Pumpkin Patch. We do the pumpkin patch partially because it's a proven fundraiser. The other reason is we're trying to get people excited about glass arts. So we have had over 40 volunteers be involved in making the pumpkins. We have people who stuck with us and now are making their own glass art as well. I love seeing the excitement in people's eyes when they try something that they never thought they could do. That moment when people discover they can actually do it, they can make glass. There is a spark that happens. It's just amazing and people feel empowered. There is really a heritage of glass in Indiana. The ideas have changed a little bit. The philosophy has changed a little bit but the tools remain the same. I considered moving other places, but I thought, no, the glass is here. We might as well stay. It is part of what made the state, and, and we can claim that.